We're gonna do a complete teardown of one of these air hydraulic cylinders and show you how they work, what all the pieces look like, and how they can fail, starting now. You guys have probably seen these air hydraulic cylinders on everything from tubing vendors to engine lifts. And they take air at about 120 PSI, they exchange it for oil pressure, and they pump it in, and they extend a cylinder out the top. I wanna to show you guys what can go wrong, and we're gonna take one apart and help you guys understand how they work and how to service them. When we're in here, we're gonna discover what it would take to turn one of these into a spring. This one moves freely and actually has compressed air in it. And it's a weird problem they end up having, and it's easy to get that air out, and we will show you how. So to take this apart, we've already broken loose some of the hard to take off items, but I'm gonna show you how they come apart. This is the rod nut. We're gonna unthread it, and you will see it pops right off. There's a hard plastic seal sealing the rod nut to the reservoir top. And inside here, there's an O-ring. This is the rod packing or rod seal. It stops oil from leaking out past the cylinder. Now that that is out, we can show you the cylinder itself. So this is the rod. And at the end where the pressure is acting is the piston. Now this piston is very small relative to the rod diameter. Usually on hydraulic cylinders, this would be much larger. This one operates at a very high pressure, so it's able to get a substantial amount of force with a relatively small piston diameter. One other thing this cap does is as the rod extends, since the piston is bigger than the rod and the rod fits closely in the cap, when it gets to the end, that cap also stops the rod from extending all the way. So it is also the travel stop. Now this is a one way acting cylinder. So pressure pushes the rod out and then you push the rod back down or a load with gravity or in the case of our tubing bender, return springs. So there's the seal on here. This, this is the rod seal or piston seal. The next thing we're gonna take off is the reservoir. So the reservoir comes off and this is where the oil is stored inside. And you can see that there is another tube inside of there. That tube is both the outer wall of the hydraulic cylinder. So it's the typical hydraulic cylinder you see that would actually force this out. And because the reservoir is built around it, it is also the inner wall of the reservoir where the oil is stored. We'll get into more on how that air is exchanged later. If you take the reservoir cylinder tube out, you will notice in the bottom there is ball bearings, and, and a washer. The washer's job is to prevent the ball bearings from falling out, and the ball bearings act as a valve. So the ball bearings have a seat, and when pressure's up against them on one side, they seal. When it's on the other side, they move away from the seat, and they allow free flow in one direction. They also fall out, so we're gonna leave cylinder rod sleeve in. Now, let's have a look at the air pump. So, this is an air over oil pump. I'm gonna show you how the piston size relative to the oil orifice diameter multiplies the force and subsequently divides the volume and gives us a very high pressure but low volume flow that we so desperately need to get a good force out of a hydraulic system. This is the air valve. So all this does is literally let air flow through it relatively unrestricted. And the chug chug you hear when you're running these is that pump running. I'll show you exactly what I mean on this one. 
The chug is the piston in this pump moving up and down. Every single time you hear that sound, there's one cycle of the piston. But this valve just lets air flow unrestricted. So there's a spring in here. I'm going to give this a light clink while I take it apart. You will notice there is a spring inside of the pump. And then we have an upper cap and we have a piston and we have a second size piston. Now, there is one critical thing inside this piston. You will see there are some grooves inside of this piston. Those grooves allow air to go past the piston when it goes beyond them. They are wider than either one of these O-ring surfaces. So when an O-ring surface goes past, it allows air to just jump over the piston or under the piston in this case. So let's put this together and see how it works. We have, I'm going to ignore the spring for now. Air comes in the top. When you open the valve, you get air flowing into this cap. It just comes in right here. The piston is sitting in the sleeve right above the cap, just like this. It starts pushing down on here. There's a controlled volume inside of here and it pushes downward and pushes the piston down. This is the very simple part. It pushes down on this rod and this rod, so the piston has a diameter of 2.8 inches. That's an area of roughly six and a half square inches. When it pushes down with 120 PSI, if you multiply that out, you get 748 pounds of linear force. So 748 pounds is pushing down on this little thin rod. This rod is 0 0.05 square inches in cross-sectional area. So when it pushes into this orifice, this tiny little hole, which fits very, very closely, it is another piston pump. This is the piston and this is the sleeve and it pushes down and it shoves oil through this hole, which comes up through one of these holes, through one of those spring-loaded valves I was telling you about. It's a ball bearing, it's a one-way valve. Anything, air or oil, that gets pushed through here will allow into the cylinder. And in this case, at tremendous pressure. That pressure is that 748 pounds divided by the 0 0.05 square inches of cross-sectional area of this rod. That happens to be just barely over 15,000 PSI. So that is the amount of pressure that is acting on this relatively small piston. You get that force divided by that area and the resulting linear force for the rod to come out is 16,000 linear pounds. It moves quite a bit slower than the air, but you get that nice mechanical advantage, that multiplier, the division of speed, but the multiplication of force, and you're left with eight tons or 16,000 linear pounds of pushing force, which is fantastic. So this only happens once in the way I've explained it so far. It pushes down and then it stops. Let me explain why it goes, goes the other direction. There's a spring, the air at 748 pounds, I'm not that strong, can easily overcome that spring. It's gonna compress that spring as the piston goes down. And like I told you, there are those two grooves inside this wall of this cylinder. When it gets to those two grooves, it allows air to go from the top at 120 PSI around the first wall of the piston. And this is the clever part. There is a little pop-up piece that puts a hole through the piston. There's holes in the side the air goes around that little groove into the side of the piston. And on the inside, it's allowed to push up this little vent. When it pushes up that vent, you have 120 PSI on top, 120 PSI on bottom. That's a resultant net zero pressure. And then the only force inside the plastic pump is this spring. And it has more than enough force to push the piston back up again. When the piston comes up to the top, it contacts the cap 
Keep in mind, this is up, allowing the air to be equal pressure top and bottom. When it comes up, it's going fast with that spring pushing it, and it hits the top, closes that valve, and now it's a solid piston again. There's no holes in it. It has 120 PSI on top, and the bottom air has been vented out because there's also ports on the bottom once it gets up that high. So it takes the 120 PSI off the bottom, seals up the top, keeps 120 PSI on the top, and it starts going down again. So these little pumps, despite being extremely simple, are a fantastic exchange for air to high pressure oil through mechanical advantage and some relatively simple mechanics. So if you have one of these pumps and it picks up air, it will push air up into the hydraulic part of the cylinder. This is the cause of most people's problems. They end up with air inside the cylinder where there is supposed to be just oil. Okay, so when this is down, there's only supposed to be oil between the pump and filling up the inside of this rod. If you ever run it with it sideways in the wrong orientation, too low on oil, it'll start scavenging air and oil, and it'll push all those bubbles into the cylinder. The nice thing is there's almost no room in here when it's all the way closed. So bleeding it is very simple. You just stand it up vertically, you open up the hydraulic valve all the way, and you push this down, the rod end. You're gonna hear some bubbles go through the pump and the valve and everything else, and then you keep it vertical and you run it again. It's gonna pick up just oil from the air pump and pump just oil in, and you can do that a couple of times and you will hear that there's no air and bubbles moving through it any longer. In terms of filling these up, the reservoir is very, very simple. It's just a hollow tube and it has a plug in it. So you just pull the rubber plug out and then with the cylinder rod all the way compressed and this vertical, you fill it up just like you would a differential or a transmission until oil runs out. It's gonna fill up the oil around this rod and inside of this tube and that's the oil level. Sometimes you have to run a little bit more oil than what the manufacturer recommends. We have noticed that uh, some manufacturers have this plug hole down here and some of them actually have a little bit up closer to the front. So we allow our customers to fill these with one ounce of extra oil at a time, bleeding and testing to make sure they travel the full stroke in our machinery, up to a maximum of three ounces of overfill. Keep in mind that when they ship from the manufacturer, they almost always are deficient of oil. So bleed it, and then fill it to the right level, then check it, and then you may overfill. So I said these can pick up air and it's easy to get out. The way you get the air out of them, if there's air where it doesn't belong, is just by bleeding it. If you find that it's spring-loaded, you can kind of pull this off to the side, so there's a cap, and if you collapse it, you'll actually hear the air come out. I heard a little bit of air come out because the reservoirs do end up getting pressurized if that happens. So it's pretty easy to get the air out of them. Some of the other problems we have seen are the W block on the tubing bender itself interfering. So if you have one of our tubing benders, this is the frame for one. The W block is what we call this piece right here. It's what holds the spring return that pulls the cylinder back and returns all that fluid back into the reservoir once you're done having the air and oil push the rod out while you're bending or lifting an engine or whatever your cylinder's doing. These springs will bring it back. And of course there's generous room between it and the frame and it's all the way back. If there's ever not, you will notice that it will not go all the way back. So this one's all the way back, there's plenty of room. This W block, as we call it, can get in the way of the frame. So make sure W block is all the way forward against, in this case, the HD sleeve, or just all the way forward to the end of the increased diameter portion on the hydraulic cylinder, which is this part right here. So if you're rebuilding one of these cylinders, you're going to buy a kit from us or from someone else that looks like this. This includes several of the seals. Some of them are really large, some of them are really small, but you will notice that there are corresponding seals all over these. The ones in the air pump we've never seen go out. The ones in the end of the rod we have, so What you will do is take the plastic cup and the O-ring and they get replaced on the end of the hydraulic cylinder. These ones are stuck on here, but. go. 
So this has a backup cup and an O-ring, and those two things together are able to hold the pressure in this system. So the rear kit comes with both of those. Be sure to reinstall in the same orientation you removed in. Never install any natural butadiene rubber, NBR, O-ring seal, dry, ever. Clean oil, a light coat, for every single seal application, always put the acting lubricant on the sealing product prior to installation. Do not roll them on, do not stretch them on. They do not stretch while they're being installed. So uh, the large one is a reservoir seal. There's also a large clear plastic one for the bottom reservoir seal. So the clear reservoir seal goes under the cap and that's the cap that goes onto the top of the reservoir. It gets compressed right there. This takes a considerable amount of torque to seal. And then the other one, the large rubber one, seals at the bottom of the reservoir down here. You will see this one is actually still in place, but it is right here. So that's the seal for the lower part of the reservoir. So obviously the compression of the rod nut is what is seeing both of the seals in compression. Other things you can replace seals on, uh, there is a seal underneath the valve, the hydraulic valve, and there's also seals in the hand pump. Uh, we do not typically require servicing the hand pumps because they aren't used a whole lot when you've got air power. But they're pretty easy to service. They come right apart with a little roll pin. And you can take this guy out. There's of course another washer in here, as well as some more ball bearing valves. You can pull this guy out. It's got another O-ring seal on it, and there is no seals inside of this part. Um, actually, there's a little rubber seal at the very top. So this is another very small piston pump that depends on mechanical advantage. You attach a long lever to this piece and you use mechanical advantage, and of course a very small piston, not as small as the other one in area to get your high pressure and your low flow that we need to extract these hydraulics with a great amount of force. My last bit of advice is two more gotchas on these hydraulic cylinders. So the first one is how far in you put the air fitting into the cap of the air pump. If you put this threaded fitting, this little banjo nut, too far into this cap, it will stick through these threads far enough that it will interfere with the movement of this piston. It will actually stop the piston from coming all the way up. If it can't come all the way up, it will only cycle one time and it will stop forever. So you very easily remedy that. You just take this out, put more tape on the threads, and don't thread it in as far the second time. Then the threads will not be protruding through into the piston area, they will not interfere with its movement, and it will operate as intended. The other thing that you can do is you can use a rubber mallet on the casting, not the more delicate reservoir tube, and you can tap it to free up the ball bearing valves. We mentioned there's steel ball bearings in a bunch of the valve seats, and those can get stuck depending on the viscosity of the oil and if there's any debris present. And so in shipping, those can become slightly lodged and just a light tap with a mallet on these castings can help free them up. We do test them here before they leave our shop, but if you bought one um, from another seller, that's definitely a common cause of them being returned and it is not warranted. They're very easy to just tap and free up and it'll allow them to work just fine. So I hope this video has been very informative. I know I was very surprised when I opened these up and saw how little uh, in terms of complexity was inside of them. And uh, I was really excited to see how easy they were to work on. So if this video has taught you anything at all, please subscribe to our channel. We have a whole bunch of fantastic videos on tube bending and tools and other useful shop tips and information. And of course, like and comment. Thank you.